record yes the record started okay perfect all right so welcome everyone uh so today it's my pleasure to introduce to you professor marco cicchini uh so marco graduated in chemistry at the university of bologna italy before obtaining his phd degree in modeling and simulations of proteins at the university of zurich switzerland under supervision of professor amadeo kaflisch he then moved to the university of strasbourg for a postdoc under the supervision of nobel laureate martin Karplus. Uh, where he has since remained to start an independent career as a junior PI at the age of 35 and has now evolved to the head of the Laboratory of Molecular Function Engineering. His major contributions to the field include the formulation of the first atomic model of synaptic receptors activation in pentameric ligand-gated ion channels and the first structural characterization of the physiologically active state at glycine receptors. Um, and nowadays, his research group mostly focuses on the use of computational simulation methods to study molecular function and allosteric regulation in molecular motors and neurotransmitter receptors uh, to predict molecular self-assembly and develop efficient numerical strategies for the calculation of uh, free energy. And today we will hear about one of those topics uh, in his webinar titled Targeting Allosteric Modulators for Neurotransmitter Receptors Using Rational Design. So without further ado, uh, Professor Cicchini, please, the virtual stage is yours. Okay, Martin, thank you very much for this very official and nice introduction. Um, so uh, let me share my screen so that we can get started. Okay, now I want to sort of, yeah, maybe minimize this. I can actually do this, yeah, like this. And uh, yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, the the the, orig the title originally was uh, uh, targeting allosteric modulators uh, for neurotransmitter receptors uh, using rational design. I don't even remember if I gave this title or this title was uh, sort of assigned uh, originally uh, based on let's say my expertise. Uh, but uh, uh, what I would like to do today, because uh, um, I wanted to, so I thought about how I could contribute to the Allot Consortium uh, some time ago, and I thought it was a good idea to sort of have uh, a lecture about uh, um, uh, agonism, antagonism, and allosteric modulation in proteins uh, using synaptic receptor as a model, because uh, actually that's what I know, and so uh, I can provide example starting from this family of very important allosteric proteins. And so uh, when I, I came to uh, the preparation of this webinar, so I thought it, a good title uh, could have been actually Rational Design of Agonists, Antagonists, and Allosteric Modulators Through a Theoretical Chemistry Perspective. And so what I would like you to uh, introduce uh, with is uh, uh, essentially uh, models that can join the concepts of ligand bioactivity with affinities. And so in order to do so, uh, I would like to start with a sort of a prologue that is uh, uh, commenting on the relationship that there's between uh, ligand affinities and bioactivity. Uh, yeah, so now people... So some lay people are coming, so I let them in. Uh, and so the, the, the basic idea is uh, uh, that when you want to find drugs, uh, the goal is uh, uh, designing uh, pharmacological attributes. And so designing activity or biological activity. And so this activity uh, generally is uh, understood in terms of potency, which is the ability of a molecule to uh, promote a response of the receptor at very low concentration. So the more potent the molecule is, the lower the concentration at which th this molecule is actually active. Then there's a, a ligand efficacy that is related to the amount of response that a molecule can actually achieve at a given concentration. And then obviously a very important parameters is selectivity because you wanna have molecules that actually are able to elicit a response of the receptor, but uh, to a specific target uh, to avoid essentially side effects. So those are the three quantities that in principle we want to optimize when you do drug design, that is potencies, so ligand potencies, ligand efficacies, and ligand selectivities. However, 
when we do uh, structure-based drug discovery, most of the time what we are going to optimize is ligand affinity. So a very important question that is around, let's say what I'm, I'm going to describe in my webinar, is what is the relationship between affinity and activity? Now, in terms of affinity, affinity determinations, uh, uh, in general, both experimental affinity de determinations and calculations aim at evaluating what we call a KD. KD is a dissociation constant. So given a reaction, as it is written here, that's an association reaction. So we have a receptor plus a ligand, which gives a complex, which I have called LR. So it's a complex uh, uh, receptor ligand. So that's... Uh, it's an equilibrium, it's a chemical equilibrium. And so you see that on the left-hand side, the ligand is unbound, while on the right-hand side, the ligand is bound. So we may consider this reaction as a two-state reaction, so the ligand bound on, on the left-hand side, and the ligand, so the ligand unbound on the left-hand side, and the ligand bound on the right-hand side. And so what is a KD is basically uh, the equilibrium constant that is governing this chemical equilibrium. And it is associated to the difference in free energy between the unbound state and the bound state of the ligand. And so those are these two levels, which are uh, plotted in, in to this diagram, that is a free energy as a function of the binding reaction coordinate. So on the left-hand side, over here, there's a free energy level in the unbound state. And then over here on the right, you find the free energy level of the bound state. So if this reaction is spontaneous, and so if binding occurs, the free energy of the bound state is lower than the free energy of the unbound state. And so that's what, what you see. So the delta G at standard condition, that's something that we should remember, is associated to the equilibrium constant through this equation here. So if you can measure this difference in free energy, and then you do the exponential of minus this delta G divided by RT, you have the value of KD. And so this tells you that the lower is this um, delta G. So the, the actually the, the larger in modulus is the delta G. The lower will be the KD. And so the KD is uh, uh, this dissociation constant. Now, uh, when we think of uh, actions of ligands uh, uh, in vivo, so sometimes actually uh, there's no uh, time uh, for reaching equilibrium. And so um, sometimes the KD is not really very relevant for uh, actually uh, predicting activity. And so in this paper by Pan, Sho, and et al. in 2013, actually there's uh, data associated to the uh, adenosine receptor A2A. And it is shown that actually if you plot for a series of ligand, the relationship, or if you want the correlation between the efficacy of the ligand and the KD, actually you have very little correlation. So the R square is 0 0.15. So this plot shows that actually there's no strong correlation between the affinity and the activity in a given receptor. However, when you try to plot the correlation between the bioactivity, so the efficacy, and the residence time that is actually associated to the um, dissociation uh, rate, actually have a very strong correlation with an R-square of 0 0.95. So that was one of the first uh, evidence that actually affinities uh, may be not completely relevant or not always relevant for evaluating uh, bioactivities. And so uh, activity and affinity are different quantities. And obviously, if you want to solve this puzzle, we need to find a relationship between the two. And so in my talk today, what I would like to do is trying to draw a link between these two quantities. And these links, as you will see, go through models and so through chemical models. And so by using these chemical models, which are actually very general, uh, we can draw conclusions on the three quantities that I talked about at the beginning. So potency, efficacy, and selectivity in terms of affinities. Now, uh, since uh, my uh, main field of research is in uh, um, the exploration of ligand-gated ion channels, which are neurotransmitter receptors, I would like to use actually those proteins, those allosteric proteins, as uh, a model to describe uh, this relationship and to describe the pharmacology of important receptors. And so if we think of uh, synaptic receptors, uh, um, 
and the action that they actually accomplish, which is a synaptic neurotransmission, then we need to go to uh, neurons uh, and neurological activity. And so uh, the importance of this receptor is actually uh, very striking. So uh, for instance, if you want to grab an object with your hand, so essentially you have to uh, send a signal from your brain uh, through your muscles up to the end in such a way that, that the hand can actually grab this object. And so uh, since uh, uh, actually the distance between the brain and the hand is macroscopic, uh, so this signal should go through multiple uh, actually cells, excitable cells, which are called uh, neurons. And so this signal should go until uh, it reaches the hand so that the hand uh, can finally grab the object. So um, in order to uh, uh, have neurons communicate, uh, this communication, of course, actually, we don't have a single neuron, but we have multiple neurons. So this uh, communication, of course, at what we call the synaptic terminals. And so synaptic terminals are highlighted here. And now I'm zooming in. So in the synaptic terminal, what you observe is essentially a presynaptic terminal, which is not in contact with the postsynaptic terminal. And there's a space, which is called the synaptic cleft. So these neurons are individual cells which don't have a physical contact among them. And so what happens uh, during synaptic neurotransmission is that an action potential actually invades the presynaptic terminus that is depicted here. And so this invasion leads to the release of molecules, signaling molecules, which are depicted here as green dots in the synaptic cleft. And these signaling molecules are also called neurotransmitter. They can actually diffuse and they can bind to receptors which sit in the postsynaptic membrane. And so these receptors, once they're bound to the neurotransmitter, they open an ion channel, and so that ions can go through the postsynaptic membrane, and effectively they convert a chemical signal, that is a sudden increase in the concentration of neurotransmitter, into an electrical signal that is associated to the flux of ions through the postsynaptic cleft. So these receptors, from a molecular point of view, they actually transduce a chemical signal into an electrical signal. Now, from a molecular point of view, these uh, proteins are actually integral transmembrane proteins. They are multimers, so uh, they can be tetram the trimers, tetramers, or pentamers, and they can populate multiple conformational states. So what I'm depicting here in cartoon is essentially a minimum or a minimal model of synaptic uh, uh, neurotransmission, where you observe that these ion channels are either in the closed channel state or in the open channel state, and so they can allow the passage or not of the ions. And so in uh, the resting state of the receptor, uh, the ion channel is closed and neurotransmitter is not bound actually to the, to the channel. And when the uh, concentration of neurotransmitter increases as a consequence of the action potential, these molecules can bind to the neurotransmitter and then can elicit a very fast conformational change. It is one of the fastest uh, protein isomerization that is known in nature. That allows the uh, opening of an ion channel and uh, so that ions can actually go through the channel uh, at the rate of millions of ions per second which really is a macroscopic current that one can measure. And so uh, protein activation involves obviously a conformational transition and a binding of the signaling molecule to the actual cell or domain. Now, uh, actually in reality, the mechanism of synaptic neurotransmission is more complex than that because uh, what, we, what we have observed experimentally by doing electrophysiology, and then I will come back to this uh, in a minute, uh, is that if we keep providing agonist, actually you have a decrease in the signal, a spontaneous decrease in the signal, so a spontaneous decrease in the current that is actually uh, uh, translocating through the channel as a function of time. And this process is called desensitization, and it is conceived as an additional conformational transition towards a state that has got an even higher affinity for the agonist, but where the, where, where the ion channel is closed. And so uh, essentially uh, chemical models uh, that describe uh, synaptic neurotransmission involve multiple state of the receptor. So you see a resting state, which we call R, 
an active state, which is called A, and a desensitized state, which are in equilibrium. And dependently on the presence or not of neurotransmitter, so this equilibrium can be shifted to the active or to the desensitized state. Now, the focus of my research is uh, uh, not on ligand Getty ion channel in general, but in particular on the pentameric family. The pentameric family, because for historical reasons, it was one of the first that was actually uh, studied and isolated, so with a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, but most importantly, because uh, pentameric ligand Getty ion channel are very important pharmacological targets. And so just to give you a few example, in this family, we can find the GABA receptor, the glycine receptor, or the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Uh, among others, we can also find the serotonin receptor. But I'm just mentioning these three, so the GABA glycine and nicotinic, nicotinic acetylcholine, because it's quite impressive, uh, the range of ligands that actually can target those receptors. And so if, if you think of the GABA receptor, GABA receptors are the major target of benzodiazepines, which are very, very important uh, uh, pharmaceuticals uh, in the market, and barbiturates. Concerning the glycine receptor, they're targeted by general anesthetics like propofol and also psychoactive compounds like the cannabinoids, so tetrahydrocannabinol, but also tropines like ondocetron. And concerning uh, nicotinic receptors, so they're targeted by nicotine, and so uh, they are related to the addiction to nicotine, or they're implicated in the addiction to nicotine, and also by um, natural venoms uh, uh, like cobra toxin or conotoxins uh, from animals, or also from plants. So you have tubocurin, so the, the active principles of curar, and uh, some very uh, popular myrelaxant like pancuronium, which are used in euthanasia or in lethal injections in the US. So you see that so the plethora of molecules uh, with very important bioactivities, both natural compounds and synthetic compounds, that they target these pentameric receptors, uh, which are very relevant pharmacological targets. Now, in terms of uh, uh, analysis uh, uh, for the mechanisms of synaptic neurotransmission and also regulation, uh, there are several uh, approaches, experimental approaches and computational approaches. So the, obviously the classical one is uh, functional studies by patch clamp electrophysiology. So in this kind of studies, uh, essentially by using a micro pipette, uh, you isolate a patch or a portion of an excitable cell, so a neuron, and then by using micro electrodes, you apply uh, a voltage difference and also you apply solutions which contain uh, signaling molecules. And so this can be agonists, antagonists, they can be modulators, and you can measure actually the response of the receptor or the patch, which contain more than one channel in general, to this uh, application of both voltage and a chemical concentration of modulatory compounds. So generally in, in electrophysiology, pest clamp electrophysiology, you have two setups. One setup is called wall cell, and so in this setup, we actually take a patch with multiple ions and we uh, interrogate this uh, patch. And that's a typical trace. So what you observe is uh, at the beginning, in the presence of a given potential, but in the absence of agonist, there's no current that is recorded in the initial phase. Then we apply a solution with the given concentration of agonist. And then you observe the response of the channel. So we can measure a current until, so the, which corresponds to the activation phase, until you see a peak and then a decay, time-dependent decay that I described before as a desensitization, where we actually think that the molecule now populates the desensitized state, which has got a high affinity for the agonist, but with a closed channel, until actually we remove completely, we wash out uh, the sample, uh, we remove completely the agonist, uh, and then we can go back to the basal level of activity, which correspond to going back to the resting state. Now, one curiosity is, how come you need to have a desensitization uh, mechanism or a desensitized state? Actually, the reason why this, the desensitized state is important is that when you want to transmit a signal, you want to tr transmit a signal on a short time scale, and then you obviously want to shut the, the signal. Uh, so you do not want to be uh, sort of subjected to uh, fluctuations that are associated to uh, the, the typical time scales of this of uh, uh, conformational transitions. 
And so uh, the fact of introducing this sensitization allows to transmit a signal, uh, cut the signal, and then uh, having a waiting time until we recover completely um, uh, the function uh, by returning to a resting state. Now, uh, so that that's uh, one setup, which is called the wool cell setup. Uh, when we do these experiments uh, uh, by patch clamp electrophysiology, we can also do single channel. And then at the single channel level, uh, it is quite interesting to see that basically, I mean, that, that is obviously uh, more complicated uh, from an experimental point of view, uh, because we aim at having the activation of a single channel. So uh, we need to work in spe special conditions uh, uh, with very uh, with high noise, so with a lower uh, signal to noise ratio. But what is very interesting is that when you apply a given concentration of agonists, then what we observe uh, is actually a reversible transition of the channel between a resting and, a, and an active state. So for instance, uh, if this is the basal level of the resting state, so you apply the agonist starting from time zero, so at the beginning nothing happens, then you have a certain activation, so you see a signal going, and then you come back to the resting state, then again, signal going until you go back to the resting state, then active, resting, active, resting. And so what is very interesting from this analysis is that you can actually compute or measure the probability of being open and the probability of being closed. So you can measure a sort of an equilibrium constant in the presence uh, uh, of an agonist. And you can also measure kinetics because you can measure the time uh, of, of the opening uh, state, the time of the closing. And so you can measure basically on and off rate uh, from the close to the open channel. So uh, those are very important uh, uh, experimental approaches to measure uh, function of synaptic receptors. Uh, another approach, uh, which is not functional, but is structural, is obviously uh, structural biology. So both in terms of X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM. And uh, structural studies have been particularly challenging uh, in pentameric ligand gate ion channel or in ligand gate ion channel uh, in general uh, because uh, of the size of the molecule, because these molecules are transmembrane proteins, and uh, also because uh, most of them are actually uh, heteropentamers. And so heteropentameric receptors uh, so were obviously more difficult to crystallize than homopentameric. Uh, and so that in, introduced an additional complexity. And plus also these receptors were historically very difficult to express. And so uh, for this kind of analysis, you need generally uh, large quantities of the protein uh, in purified environment. And so this was introducing uh, significant obstacles to uh, structural determination. And so the first uh, high resolution structure of a pentameric ligand gate ion channel was obtained actually quite late. So it was obtained in 2005 and not by X-ray crystallography, but it was more by cryo-EM. And the resolution at that time was not great. So it was a four angstrom resolution and that the structure was a sort of a complete structure or almost complete structure of the muscle type nicotinic acetylcholine receptor obtained by Nigel Unwin uh, from the UK. And uh, um, using actually uh, receptors extracted from the torpedo fish. Um, um, and so uh, what uh, Unwin discovered was uh, uh, a complex architecture that was actually uh, composed of five uh, uh, subunits. So it was uh, uh, a pentameric organization. It was an heteropentameric organization because in muscle type you have alpha subunits, beta, one beta subunit, one delta subunits and one gamma subunits. That's in the uh, fetal form. In the adult form of the muscle type, the gamma subunit is substituted by, uh, sorry, the delta subunit is substituted by an epsilon subunit. And uh, uh, so uh, from the cryo-EM reconstruction was showing actually this pentameric organization and also was showing the existence of three domains. So there was an extra cell, a large extracellular domain, which is depicted over here then a transmembrane domain, mostly composed of alpha helices, and then an intracellular domain. So you see that uh, these receptors are integral transmembrane proteins that can interact with the extracellular environment, but also with the intracellular environment. So they're regulated, or they can be regulated from both sides. And what was also obvious was uh, uh, actually the location of the acetylcholine uh, binding site, 
which is the natural um, neurotransmitter for this receptor, which is located at the interface between subunits, and in particular between the alpha subunit as a principal subunit and any other subunit. And so, in fact, we have only two binding sites for acetylcholine in this receptor structure. Uh, so that was in 2005. Um, something very uh, striking happened in, in the meantime. Um, and actually, there are two things. So one was the discovery of receptor homologues in bacteria that were more amenable to expression, purification, and also X-ray crystallization. That was uh, the first discovery, which led to the first high-resolution structure of complete receptors uh, uh, at atomic resolution in 2008, 2009. So it was later than the cryo-M. And then the second uh, thing obviously was the advent of cryo-M and what we call the uh, resolution revolution in cryo-M uh, starting in 2015 uh, with a, a discovery of new detectors with uh, increased sensitivity and also new algorithm for processing images in cryo-M, so collected from cryo-M which allowed actually to characterize uh, uh, several other receptors um, and most of them uh, pharmacologically relevant in humans. And so uh, starting from 2014-15, we started to have actually structures, high resolution structures for the GABA and the glycine receptor, then the glycine receptor from zebrafish. Then we went to the serotonin receptor, always in 2014. And last, the first uh, high resolution structure of the nicotinic steroid receptor was in 2016 and was done by actually tri crystallography on the uh, receptor that is called alpha 4 beta 2 is a, a neuronal receptor that is one of the most uh, abundant uh, uh, in the brain system and then the last uh, member of the family that was actually discovered was the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor alpha 7 which is an homopentamer whose structures started to appear in 2021 so uh Due to, uh, let's say, the uh, discovery of prokaryotic homologs and the revolution in cryo-M, we started collecting a very large number of structures at that resolution, which depict actually the receptor in multiple states. So in the APO state, in the absence of ligands, in the active state or a desensitized state, uh, and in, in complex with ligands. And so we can actually watch through structural biology the conformational changes between the major uh, functional state of the receptor and also uh, binding sites for ligands, for modulatory ligands. So just to give you an idea for what concerns the glycine receptor, nowadays we have more than 40 structures that have been deposited in the PDB, which depict the receptor in the three states, the three main states, resting active and desensitized, and in complex with agonist, antagonist, and also positive allosteric modulators. For what concerned the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, uh, of course, we studied later, so we have the last structures, but the field is catching up. And so we have 27 now structure deposited in the PDB. Uh, the only doubt is about the active state, which is not uh, completely uh, clarified, but we have structures for the resting and the distance state, and actually in complex with agonist antagonist, and not only positive allosteric modulators, but also negative allosteric modulators. So uh, there's a, an abundant structural information uh, about pentameric ligand ion channel. Now, another way of tackling the problem and trying to sort of uh, connect structures and function that is uh, difficult because structures are static. Uh, so they, they provide you with the atomic resolution, but they are static. And so we cannot actually infer uh, sequences of events to go from one structure to the other, nor we can infer energetics. On the other hand, functions, of functional studies are uh, actually more relevant because they tell you uh, something about the response of the receptors to external stimuli, but there's very little uh, structural information uh, in this uh, analysis. And so obviously connecting structures and function is very relevant and cannot be done with the two techniques that I described before. And so uh, what people do, and that's where we introduce our contribution, is actually starting from high resolution structures. So trying to study the dynamics of these molecules. And so try to connect uh, the function, uh, sorry, the structure and function through the dynamics and eventually also free energy calculations. So what I'm depicting here is an animation uh, of a prokaryotic channel that we simulated in 2013. So there's a paper we published in PNAS uh, where we simulated actually um, 
two uh, prokaryotic channels, uh, one that was supposed to be open, one that was supposed to be closed, and uh, um, a lower eukaryotic channel that was in complex uh, uh, with a positive allostatic modulator. And we compared the dynamics, and so we identified sort of structural observables that were defining activation or deactivation, and then we came up with a, with a mechanism for activation that was basically the first uh, um, uh, model of gating with atomic resolution. So why we are keen on studying actually these proteins using molecular dynamics? Because, well, first of all, uh, molecular dynamics is a single molecule experiment by definition. And so we look at individual molecules. So it's a sort of a minimalistic approach. Second, because actually molecular dynamics, as you, I'm sure you know, it's time resolved and you have the full atomistic resolution. So you can look at details and you can look at sequences of events. Uh, obviously not uh, on the time scale of simulations. You cannot expect to have spontaneous transitions unless you do something special. And that's what we have actually devised in order to study uh, mechanism, so to uh, obtain mechanistic insight. Uh, then obviously uh, you can try to explore the structure to function relationship, as I mentioned before. And what is also nice is that nowadays molecular dynamic simulations, even for large systems like uh, these receptors, they start to cover the physiologically relevant timescales. And so what you observe in ND simulations is actually relevant. And for instance, so one striking example was about uh, uh, pathway for ion conductance. Now, if I want to show just a few highlights of my research in this field, so as I mentioned before, so we came up with the first model uh, of activation or deactivation uh, in 2013. Then we could simulate actually uh, the full deactivating transition. So we started from uh, an open channel state in complex with agonist, and we removed the agonist, and we saw the spontaneous evolution towards a closed channel state. And so we could actually uh, capture by microsecond simulations a spontaneous closing of the channel. And so we could actually characterize with atomic resolution the pathway to close. And that was actually uh, was illuminated for the first time, uh, including some intermediates. Then uh, a problem that we could tackle was uh, the problem of the functional annotation of structures, because actually when you solve uh, high resolution structures of channels, uh, it's very difficult uh, to infer or to conclude on which physiological state the structure is representative of. And so what we, uh, I, what we uh, introduced was uh, what we called computational electrophysiology approach, in which essentially you take structures, you simulate those structures, and then you apply in simulation uh, a, a voltage potential, and then you look at the permeation of ions. And then these uh, uh, simulations can actually uh, tell you whether the ions are, so whether the channel is permeable or non-permeable to the ions that are supposed to permeate, and so whether the channel is closed or open. And actually, we can also compute, since we apply uh, a voltage and we can measure a current, we can compute a conductance. And so we can compare the conductance that we predict numerically with the conductance that is measured experimentally. And so we can actually see whether the structures are meaningful or non-meaningful. And so one of the things that we concluded, for instance, on the glass receptor is that uh, the structure of the active state that, that was proposed as to representative of the active state was physiologically irrelevant because it was five times more conductive than in the experiment. And so we could actually capture another structure that was um, uh, more closely related to the conductance, the experimental conductance. And we concluded that this model that was coming from MD was more representative of the active, physiologically active state than the cryo-EM structure. Obviously, that was difficult to defend. So it took us two years of fights uh, to get the papers published, which was eventually in 2018. And what was very actually reassuring uh, for us was that uh, subsequent analysis, which were cryo-EM analysis, which were done uh, in sort of native lipid-like conditions, were confirming that what we captured as uh, a model of the open state was actually more meaningful uh, than the original active state structure that was sold in the presence of detergents. So you see that also these details uh, in terms of uh, the structural biology are very important. And uh, since this uh, uh, structure are very flexible and the energetics underlying the transitions is uh, uh, relatively uh, low energetics, so external perturbation can produce artificial uh, results, so artifacts. Now, more recently in 2022, and that was I, was I mentioned before, uh, 
so we uh, started to study uh, the pathway for ion translocations uh, in the glycer receptor that is a chloride uh, gate uh, so it's chloride channel is a uh, glycine gated chloride channel and so we observed actually uh, surprisingly that ions don't follow the uh, textbook pathway that is actually the vertical direction of the channel but they pass the transmembrane domain and then instead of going vertical uh, again so they actually they were getting out uh, laterally so through lateral fenestration so we discovered these lateral fenestrations in our simulations which was a surprising and puzzling observation and then uh, after uh, two years of experiments we could actually show uh, in collaboration uh, uh, with the institute pasteur that this lateral permeation was were, were actually very relevant so it was uh, uh, that were related to the um, main translocation pathway for uh, chloride uh, anions. And so they were for real. And they, were, they, they could explain uh, the surprising phenotype in an anomalous mutant, which were rectifying mutants uh, with mutations that were far away from the ion pore. And so the last uh, result that we published uh, uh, actually this year, the beginning of the year, was the discovery of uh, a preactive intermediate in the glycine receptor through a combination of uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulations and voltage clamp fluorometry. And so what we observe is that there is actually a preactive intermediate which is closed uh, in terms of the channel, but it's got a certain affinity for the agonist, uh, partial agonist, and also some antagonist. And uh, since uh, the highest affinity is for the partial agonist, actually uh, partial agonist would uh, promote a transition towards the preactive state even before activation which would be followed by uh, the actual activation. And so this uh, uh, provides uh, or shed light into the mechanism of uh, uh, neurotransmitter, um, uh, so synaptic neurotransmission. All right, so uh, as I promised at the beginning, so I, I wanted to talk about the pharmacology of these channels. And so uh, I wanna go back to uh, electrophysiology and in particular the single channel electrophysiology. And uh, I want to show a trace here uh, that is uh, elicited by epipatidine, epibatidine. So epibatidine is uh, uh, this molecule that is over here. So it's an alkaloid uh, secreted from the poison dart frog in Ecuador. So that's it's a actually toxic uh, molecule uh, that is able to activate uh, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, uh, both al alpha seven, the al alpha seven receptor. And so that's a typical trace, a one millimolar concentration. So you see activation uh, of the nicotinic receptor. And obviously, if you want to study the pharmacology, so what you can do is uh, uh, repeating the experiment at different concentrations. So we can go to very low concentration where we essentially expect no activation of the receptor to saturating condition where we expect a maximal response. And so if you do so, we can actually construct using electrophysiology, what we call dose response curves. So we have points, data points, where we can monitor the open probability as a function of the concentration of agonist. And so as I mentioned before, so if you go at the 10 to the power of minus six molar concentration, so it's micromolar concentration, we see basically no activation. And then we have this uh, uh, raising curve when the concentration increases up to go uh, up to a plateau that correspond to the open probability at saturating condition of the agonist. Now, if we repeat the experiments uh, uh, using different agonists, well, we observe actually different behavior. And so that's what is shown here in those response curves of the epibatidine and the acetylcholine. And so what do you observe? So first, that is very striking, is that if I use epibatidine at saturating conditions, I can actually activate only 60% of my receptors. I cannot activate all of them, or I cannot actually activate the receptor at 100% of its time. So I need to have basically this uh, uh, up and down uh, uh, transitions between the closed state and the active state. However, when I apply acetylcholine, which is the endogenous neurotransmitter for the nicotinic receptor, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, actually what you observe is that at saturating condition, I can actually activate the receptor at 96% of the time. So you see there's a striking difference. So it, it implies that epibatidine is not able to extract the full response from the receptor while acetylcholine it is. And so that's uh, what we call efficacy, which is which corresponds to the uh, 
maximum open probability at saturating condition of agonist. So in the case of epibatidine is 60%, in the case of acetylcholine is 96%. And that's the difference between what we call a partial agonist, that would be epibatidine, and a full agonist, that is acetylcholine. Now, a second quantity that we can take a look at is what we call the EC50, and I'm sure you have heard about this. And so that is the concentration of the ligand, which corresponds to 50% of the maximum response. And so basically we can get this uh, sigmoidal function, we can get the inflection point. So the concentration and the inflection point correspond to the EC50. And so if we measure this EC50 for acetylcholine and ap -batidine, we observe that the acetylcholine needs 43 micromolar to reach 50% of the maximum response, while ap is 32 micromolar. So actually ap is more potent than acetylcholine because at the lower concentration it reaches half of the maximum response. And so that's a, a, a pharmacological attribute that we call potency. Obviously, uh, when you want to design modulatory compounds for these receptors or for losteric proteins in general, we would like to have potent compounds. So compounds are able to activate the receptor at very low concentration and also uh, efficacious compounds. So for which a given concentration can give a significant activation. Now, in terms of the efficacy, uh, the efficacy may be actually modulated uh, for drugs because in the case of uh, these receptors, uh, uh, a very strong efficacy as acetylcholine also promotes a very fast desensitization. So if you really want to sort of uh, um, activate or elicit or enhance activation, uh, maybe partial agonist may be more interesting than full agonist. Now, obviously, uh, if you do these experiments, uh, we can also uh, use compounds that have no effect on the activation um, of the receptor. And so that would what we would call a neutral antagonist or compounds that actually in the presence of an agonist or of a neurotransmitter can actually decrease the response of the receptor. And this would be what we call an inverse agonist. Now, if I want to sort of uh, summarize this picture, and generalizing it not only for ligand cation channel but for all allosteric proteins. Uh, that's a, a picture that comes from an interesting review on allosteric proteins by uh, uh, Ruth Nusinov in uh, 2014. And so basically, if I want to classify different uh, modulatory compounds, what I should monitor is those response curves uh, of these compounds, uh, which monitor the uh, probability uh, of the function, of the protein function, as a function of the concentration. And so you observe full agonist would go to 100% of function, a saturated condition, partial agonist would be between 0 and 100%. If it is 0, so it means that basically there's no effect of this molecule, this would be natural antagonist. If we go lower than basal, you see in this example, the basal activity is not 0, it's about 10% probably. So if you go lower than basal, then this would correspond to an inverse agonist. Now, in terms of that's also another curiosity, in, uh, basal activities in pentameric ligand-gated ion channels is essentially zero. So in the absence of neurotransmitter, you see no current, and that's maybe for physiological reasons. In the case of GPCR, I'm aware that uh, um, in some cases, you have 10 to 20% of basal activity, even in the absence of the agonist. And so that's why the concept of inverse agonist uh, uh, has originated. Okay, so uh, when we talk about agonists and antagonists and also inverse agonists, most of the time we talk about competitive binders. So molecules that target the same site, that is the site in the case of a ligand ion channel that is exposed to uh, the extracellular milieu and that is at the interface between subunits. Now, uh, those binders are not the only ones, obviously. And so since you're part of the ALOD, uh, you should not be actually surprised by the fact that you may have allosteric modulation of these channels. And this allosteric modulation is uh, uh, realized uh, and has got also different uh, characteristics relative to the modulation that I talked about before. Because actually allosteric modulators, uh, in most cases, they are unable per se to elicit a response from the receptor. So. The example that I'm giving here uh, is ivermectin. So this is a, a very interesting compound. It's an anti-elmintic compound. Uh, 
that is used to uh, as drug actually is uh, approved as a drug uh, against river blindness, if I remember correctly. And so uh, this molecule is uh, uh, actually a positive allosteric modulator of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor alpha-7. And so uh, what we observe if we do electrophysiology is that basically if you apply this concentration, 30 micromolar, in regular electrophysiology experiment, you actually observe no current. So avermectin per se is not able to elicit any current. By contrast, when you put 30 micromolar of acetylcholine concentration, you observe a current, and then obviously desensitization, and then you go back to the basal level. Now, if you co-apply acetylcholine and avermectin, you have no difference in the dose response curve. So in actually not in, in dose response curve, sorry, in the electrophysiology track. So you see the peak of current, and then you have desensitization. However, if you pre-apply or um, uh, if you use ivermectin uh, before acetylcholine, so if you let incubate, incubate ivermectin and then you apply acetylcholine in the same concentration, what you observe is this much stronger response of the receptor. So if you compare the current peak, this current peak is at least three to, to four times stronger in the presence of ivermectin. So uh, that's a typical behavior or phenotype of a positive allosteric modulator, so a molecule that is not able to uh, elicit the current, but can enhance currents elicited by the natural agonist. And so if you uh, now look at the dose response curve as a function of the agonist concentration with a given concentration of avermectin, then you observe that actually the presence of a PEM, so positive allosteric modulator, modulates not only the efficacy, that is basically the response you can get at saturating condition, but also the potency. And so those are very interesting compounds because actually they're not competitive. They can modulate in a plus and minus way the effect of uh, a drug or a natural agonist. And um, they can be used as pharmacological strategies to have sort of uh, uh, fine-tuned uh, pharmacologies. Uh, which may open to uh, personalized medicine. And so uh, why they're called allosteric modulators? Because first of all, they target different sites. So ivermectin targets the site that is located in the transmembrane domain of the receptor. So that's why it's not competitive with epipatidine or acetylcholine. And uh, dependently on the effect, so we can have positive or negative, we can have actually positive or negative allosteric modulator. There's also a special case in which these modulators can elicit currents on their own uh, and they're called actually agopam, so the agonist positive allosteric modulator. So they target sites which are not corresponding to the orthosteric site or neurotransmitter site, but they can actually elicit current on their own in the absence of an endogenous neuro neurotransmitter. Now, the last class of compounds that I'd like to uh, talk about is what we call unconventional modulators, because among the PAMs, you may have PAMs that actually affect the desensitization rate and some that do not affect the desensitization rate. So that's typically in the classification between type 1 and type 2 PAM. So these uh, compounds, uh, uh, NS1738 and PNAU120596, those are PAMs of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. But if you look at the uh, uh, traces, uh, so electrophysiological recordings, what you observe is that the kinetics of desensitization are very different. And in fact, I mean, they both enhance the current because you see in the absence of, of this PAM, the current is much smaller. But if you look at the kinetics, so type one, like NS1738, you have the same rapid decay during desensitization, but with PNAU, you have a much slower decay. So it looks like these type two molecules, they can slow down desensitization or even rescue already desensitized receptors. And so that's another feature of modulators that one has to consider. And also there's a, a class uh, that is called silent agonist, which is quite uh, uh, magic because you, observe, you observe here on down. So if you put acetylcholine, you have a peak of current. And when you put this new NS6740, uh, you can uh, actually you have no current or very, very tiny current, but uh, subsequent application of acetylcholine actually are not able after NS 7, uh, 70, 6740 to elicit current again. So basically you 
uh, desensitize the receptor even after several washout. And only when you reapply a type 2 PEM, it is able to rescue receptors from desensitization, you can actually have current again. So you see that you have a plethora of different phenotypes uh, that has been uh, that have been found in the literature with lots of different compounds. And so the idea would be try to identify a sort of a common framework, theoretical framework in which we can classify agonist, antagonist, partial agonist, and modulator, positive and negative, and possibly also this uh, unconventional modulator, so type 1, type 2, and silent agonist. Now, since uh, uh, pentameric lingation channels are uh, extremely interesting pharmacological targets, uh, there exists uh, a lot of a rich uh, literature about the pharmacology of these channels, particularly for uh, those that are relevant in humans. And so, uh, but however, this literature is uh, um, quite sparse, is not curated. And so most of this information is not easy to access and, and is not uh, um, actually uh, cleaned. And so uh, in an effort to provide uh, ourselves and the community with information that can be used as benchmark sets uh, or also uh, for pharmacological reasons. So we collected, essentially, we constructed two databases of allosteric modulators. So the first one is called GRAL. That's a glycine receptor allosteric ligand library. So that is really uh, what was the first example of an allosteric ligand library for one receptor. So the glycine receptor alpha-1 or alpha-3. And the second one that we recently uh, built that is called ACRAL, so I, I'm going to spend one word on, on it in a second. So what do we find in these databases? So in GRAL, for instance, we could collect 218 compounds with known detected modulatory activity at the glycoreceptor alpha-1 or alpha-3. So that's quite rich information. And so in this database, you can find, for instance, five agonists, one antagonist, actually there are not so many, actually now it's three because those are different variants, but there's so three antagonists. And then you have a significant number of positive and negative allosteric modulators, and you also have inactive compounds. So this uh, library is accessible through this uh, link and I invite you to, to discover it. Um, and what is also very relevant, so we, we could find actually different molecules. And so we have 2D uh, structures of modulatory ligands. But what we also uh, introduced in this database is what we call a structural annotation. So for about 50% of these ligands, we can actually identify, uh, or we can ac actually assign a putative binding site on the receptor. And so why is it like this? Actually, because uh, by looking at high resolution structures of the glycine receptor in complex with ligands and uh, receptor homologs, what we could identify is that actually there exist at least eight allosteric sites on the glycine receptor, which are interestingly located essentially the interface between subunits. And so in green here, I'm depicting glycine. So that's the orthosteric site. What I depict here in pink is ivermectin, which is also a modulator, a positive allosteric modulator of glycine receptor. So that's in the transmembrane domain. But you also have other binding sites. So on the top, of the extracellular domain, you have this binding site for this amgen compound. Then below the orthosteric site, you have a site where uh, tropanes bind in serotonin receptors. And then down in the transmembrane domain, you can find sites for uh, neurosteroids and also uh, sites for cannabinoids, putative sites for cannabinoids. And finally, you have also an allosteric site that is in the channel. So basically the interface between the five subunits uh, in the ion pore. Uh, where some toxins, uh, like picotoxin, bind, actually. And so based on this, first of all, we observed that, of course, we have a plethora of compounds, but these compounds can be distributed over multiple binding sites with very different physical chemical properties because uh, the extracellular domain is soluble, the transmembrane domain is not. And so uh, if you really want to use, even at the ligand-based level, this information, you need to separate uh, ligands per binding site and so we have this uh, assignment, structural notation, based on a five level of confidence, uh, which I invite you to uh, discover both the level of the website or the paper that we published. But anyway, so that's uh, an important resource that we can use in order to, uh, as a benchmark, so to, to construct the benchmark set for the design of agonists, antagonists, or partial agonists, and positive and negative modulators.
So similarly, we collected also uh, a library for the acetylcholine receptor for which more abundant pharmacological information is available for historical reasons. So in this case, we were able to collect about 4,700 compounds uh, which target uh, the three most uh, abundant uh, uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subtypes, so alpha-7, alpha-4-beta-2, and the muscle type. And similarly to acral, we provide for each of them the direction of modulation, the location of the binding site, so we can state whether it is orthostatic or allosteric. Uh, we provide information on in vivo tests, which is actually useful because if you want to find compound, compounds that can target one or the other receptor, uh, in a specific animal model, it's important to know uh, whether these compounds have been tested already. And so if you have no problem of tolerability or solubility uh, or effect, and so this information is provided. And so I invite you also to look at this uh, uh, website that is as associated to the ACRA library. And most importantly, also what we have is quantitative data on the pharmacological attributes of affinity, potency, and efficacy whenever this was possible. And so we constructed this and we uh, collected, uh, so it is accessible through a MySQL web interface uh, that can be searched uh, to access information. And so you can actually do your search yourself. And so just one word about this uh, library. So the paper is currently in preparation. Uh, so what we observe is uh, there's a, a drastic disparity uh, dependently uh, in terms of the number of compounds, dependently on the, the type of receptor that we are interested in. So for instance, in the muscle type, we have only 3% of entries, while for the neuronal receptors, alpha-7 and alpha-beta-2, we have essentially more than um, 95%. And the other thing is that if you compare Graal and Acral, we have a completely different, uh, so diametrically opposite uh, uh, scenario. So in Graal, we have very little orthostatic ligand and much positive or negative allosteric modulators. In acral is the opposite. So we have little so little allosteric modulators and many actually orthostatic ligands, which may point uh, to lack of knowledge or missed opportunities. Okay, so uh, given this uh, rather long introduction, so what we would like to do is uh, uh, actually ask the question. So some of the questions ourselves is, can we actually predict the modulation of drugs targeting synaptic receptors. So and since we have these uh, uh, resources, these databases, then uh, if we are able to classify uh, agonist versus antagonist or positive versus negative, we should be able actually to verify whether the predictions are correct or not correct. Then the second it is actually more ambitious uh, is not only whether we can predict the direction of the modulation, but can we also predict the pharmacological profile. So can we predict what is the potency of a given compound or the efficacy or the selectivity? And if so, uh, so retrospectively, can we go prospectively? So can we design actually new agonists and antagonists or can we design new PEMs and NAMs? And that would be actually tremendous. And so in order to do this, uh, we need to uh, go back to the original question that is what is the relationship between activity in terms of potency, efficacy, and selectivity and affinity? And then how can we measure affinities in order to then predict or infer on um, activities? And so uh, what I would like to, 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 to do with you now is uh, uh, showing basically how we can make the link between affinity and activity by introducing chemical models and what kind of information we can extract from this chemical model. And so if you wanna do so, uh, we need to go back to the original picture about allosteric regulation. And so that the example of the uh, ion channels. So uh, what can we observe from this example? So uh, allosteric proteins and ion channel can live in multiple states, at least two, right? So one that is a closed state, which we call a resting state, and one that is an open channel state that we can call active. So our model must include more than one state. So there must be a conformational transition between the initial state and the final state. So the inactive state and the active state. Now, the second thing is that is obvious from this uh, uh, illustration is that the uh, activation transition is elicited by ligand binding. So you observe the resting state, there's no ligand that is bound. And in the active state, you have a signaling molecule that binds. 
because actually this molecule have been designed for this to respond to external stimuli. So there must be binding events and this binding event must modulate actually uh, the transition or the activation uh, between the resting and the active state. So essentially this ligand binding must have an effect on the probability of being active for the receptor. Now with this idea in mind, I mean, the, the easiest model that we can build is actually a model in which we have uh, a protein that is uh, uh, in a given state, which I would call a resting state, and then with a ligand that binds to this uh, uh, molecule to produce an active state where a chemical reaction or uh, a function, a protein function can be actually accomplished. Now, in order to simplify the treatment, because uh, the goal of my analysis here is actually drawing chemical schemes and then extracting chemical equations that can express the probability of activation as a function of all the parameters. Okay, so the concentration of the ligand, for instance, or the affinity of the ligand for the receptor. So uh, if I want to simplify at maximum, what you can think is that basically we can consider a protein in which activation occurs without a conformational change. So we can think of the protein that is already active and in the absence of ligands, uh, there's no reaction that can take uh, a place because actually the ligand must bind. And when the ligand binds, then you can have a reaction. So you can produce products from the ligand and, and then you have uh, the, the, the protein actually releases the product and then looks for other ligands to promote other chemical reactions. So that basically, if you want, describing the Michaelis-Menten scheme from an equilibrium perspective. So that's what I would call the activation without a conformational change. So the molecule is already active in solution, okay? Which is not the case for the ligand cation channels, but that just to simplify and because it's important to, to go stepwise. So uh, in this scheme, very simple chemical scheme, what are the chemical constraints? So the chemical constraints are, uh, it is a, an equilibrium. So I consider it as an equilibrium. And so there must be an equilibrium constant. So after a sufficient uh, uh, amount of time, so I will find myself, so the protein in the active state, or if you want the resting state uh, and the ligand with given probabilities. And so this probability of the equilibrium are related to the equilibrium constant. Now, the second constraint is that actually, uh, so there must be mass conservation. And so dependently on the initial concentration of protein that I have introduced in my system. So some of this protein will be in the resting state, some of the protein will be in the active state. And so this condition must be fulfilled. Okay, so that's a very simple scheme with two chemical constraints. And so I can convert these chemical constraints into probability, first of all. And so I can say that the probability of being active plus the probability of being inactive must be equal one, which is quite understandable. And the second, which comes from actually the equilibrium constant for binding, I can write that the probability of being active is equal to uh, the probability of being inactive times this factor here, which is a ratio between the concentration of ligand divided by the KD, that is the affinity. In fact, this equilibrium in the absence of a conformational change is only a binding equilibrium. And so the, the equilibrium constant is an affinity constant, or if you want one over the affinity constant, so it's the dissociation constant. So it's the KD that is governing this equilibrium. Now, you, you see we have two equations. These two equations are in terms of PA and PR, so uh, probability of being active and probability of being inactive. So you can put the, these two equations in, in a system, and then you can solve for the probability of being active. And so if you do so, then we obtain an expression that tells what is the probability of being active. And this expression is a ratio where uh, the two parameters of this uh, uh, problem appear. And so one is the affinity of the ligand, and the second is the concentration of the ligand. So what we can actually observe from this solution, first of all, I mean, if the concentration of the ligand is much larger than the KD, so if I am at sort of saturating conditions, so this ratio goes to zero, and so the probability of being active goes to one. So essentially, as it was for the acetylcholine, at saturating conditions, the probability of being active is equal one. So we go to one. And there's actually no other possibility. Vice versa, 
if the concentration of the ligand is much smaller than the KD, well, this denominator becomes very large, and so the probability goes to zero. And so essentially, once again, we have a sigmoidal function that goes to zero at very low concentration of ligand. So the first thing is that in the absence of a conformational change, actually, at saturating condition, the probability of being active will be one. So every molecule that binds will be a full agonist. So there's no partial agonist. The second thing, the second conclusion is in the special case in which the concentration of the ligand is actually equal to the KD. So this is becomes, the ratio becomes equal one. So the PA becomes one over two. So this condition, the concentration of the ligand that is equal to KD is actually a condition that correspond to what we call the EC50. So in this very simple scheme, a protein that is essentially radioactive binds to a ligand to promote a chemical reaction. So the EC50 is coincident with the KD. So in this case, affinity and activity are the same thing. So what do we learn from this simple example? So that in the absence of a conformational transition that mediates activation, agonist efficacy is always unit. So there's no partial agonism possible. And second, that potency depends only on the ligand binding affinity. So the more affine is the ligand to the, the protein, the lower will be the EC50. And so the more potent will be the ligand. And so essentially there's a very strong correlation between activity and affinity in this very simple scheme. Now, what happens if we introduce actually now a conformational change? So we modify our chemical reaction scheme by just introducing a further step. And so in the first step, we have the binding of the ligand to the inactive form of the receptor to form a complex. And then the receptor undergoes a conformational transition to become active. So similar as before, so we have chemical constraints. We will have the same chemical constraint for the binding equilibrium. We have an additional chemical constraint that is this isomerization constant associated to, to the inactive and the active form in the presence of ligand. And so this constant, we'll call it E1, one because there's one ligand that is bound. So that's what we call the liganded isomerization constant. And then obviously we have, we have the mass balance uh, uh, equation, uh, conservation of, uh, of mass, uh, which completes actually the, the scheme. And so similar to what we have done before, we can actually transform these chemical constraints into probabilities. And then we can solve for the probability of being active. And now we have an expression which is slightly more complicated. And so let's see what are the limits of this expression. So if I consider myself at very low concentration, so concentration of ligand that is much smaller than the KD, then similar as before, so the denominator wins over everything else, and so the probability goes to zero. So there's no activation at very low concentration. So nothing surprising. Now, what happens when I go to saturating conditions? So if L is much larger than KD, then this initial element becomes zero. And so I have an expression of the open probability, which now is not always equal one, but depends on the isomerization constant in the presence of ligands. So you see this E1 is a value of the, of the constant, of the gating constant. Now, if I go to um, single channel electrophysiology measurements, where people have measured this uh, uh, liganded isomerization constant of the muscle type receptor uh, with the acetylcholine and with, with TMA, that is uh, tetramethylammonium, so with a full agonist and a partial agonist. Well, those are the numbers that, that we observe. So with acetylcholine, the equilibrium constant is 27, so it's pretty large. While with tetramethylammonium is 3.5. So if you now substitute these numbers into this equation, you will see that with 27, so the denominator is essentially the same, as the numerator, so PA is equal one. So acetylcholine is really full agonist. And we go to one open maximum probability. While if we put 3.5, so 3.5 divided by 3.5 plus one, so 3.5 divided by 4.5 is actually about 78%. Uh, and so tetramethylammonium 
actually behaves like epibatidine. So quite interest interestingly, this equation says that it is sufficient to introduce a conformational change in this equilibrium scheme to let partial agonism emerge again. Now, the second thing is that what we know is that the EC50 of the ligand is the concentration of the ligand for which we have half of the maximum response to the receptor. So since we have an expression for PA and also for PA max, that is what we have um, derived before, we can actually put these two expression, we can equalize the two expression, and then we can derive an expression for the EC50. And now uh, what we can observe is that the potency of a ligand depends on both its affinity for the receptor, and that was similar to the result that we had before in the absence of a conformational change, but also depends on the liganded isomerization constant. That is essentially the intrinsic ability of the protein to do activation when it is bound to a ligand. So you have two factors. And so you may imagine two ligands that have the same affinity for two different receptors, which have different ability of undergoing activation. This would have very different EC50. So in this specific case, activity and affinity are not the same. Now, what do we learn from this uh, slightly more complicated example? So if I introduce a conformational change mediating activation, which I would call an allosteric transition, so that's why it's very relevant for the allowed consortium. Now, ag agonist efficacy, that is the opening, the maximum opening probability, now depends on the isomerization constant and which actually explains partial agonism. Because if the isomerization constant is very large, then we go to one, and so we have a full agonist. While if the isomerization constant is actually close to one, then we go to some, something that is uh, a partial agonist. And the same is true for potency, because potency does not depend only on the affinity, as in the absence of a conformational change, but depends also on the isomerization constant, which actually, for instance, explains the effect of allosteric mutations, because you may have different EC50s for different mutants of the same protein, although the mutation is not actually in the binding site of the ligand. So if the binding site of the, of the ligand, the orthosteric site, is not changed by the mutation, so there's no reason for changing the affinity, but still you can have different EC50s associated to different ligands. So already uh, having introduced a single conformational change, uh, makes a difference between affinity and activities. Now, another thing that I want to introduce is uh, uh, using the same uh, approach, uh, I, would call, I would call a theoretical chemistry approach, although it is relatively simple. We can actually study also competition experiments, and so uh, the binding of antagonists, for instance. Now, how can you do so? So uh, I suggest to... Uh, go back to the simple scheme. So in the absence of a conformational change, so this would be what you have on the right-hand side. So resting state plus the ligand that goes to active state with ligand bound. And then that's one equilibrium. But at the same time, there's also another equilibrium in parallel that is the resting state plus an inhibitor that promotes uh, the stabilization of the resting state and so no transition to the active state, okay? So in this case, I would be an antagonist. So this could be, uh, yeah, an antagonist. And for instance, uh, uh, in the case of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, the muscle type that is depicted in, in here. So uh, this would be a neurotoxin, the effect of neurotoxin. So if we measure uh, current amplitudes at very low concentration of this toxin, we have a given value that is associated to the specific concentration of the agonist, so acetylcholine or nicotine or epipatidine. And then if we keep the same concentration of agonists and we start introducing more antagonists, we observe a decay in the current until zero. So it's saturating condition of the toxin. Essentially, there's no current that can be recorded. And so we can have this sigmoidal uh, behavior. So with the one at low concentration of uh, toxin and zero at high concentration of toxin. And so we can associate through the inflection point, essentially the IC50 of this toxin. And so the idea now is using the same approach, chemical approach is expressing this IC50 in terms of affinities. 
and see what are the conclusion that we can draw. So what are the chemical constraints? So we do have actually two binding events. So one is uh, for the endogenous agonist, one is for the antagonist. And so we, we have actually two dissociation constant that we call KD for the agonist and KI for the antagonist. And then we have an equation that actually uh, grants uh, conservation of mass. And so we can also go to probabilities as we have done already and expressing the probability of the inhibited state. And so we have an expression like this. And what is interesting in this expression is that basically if we put uh, ourselves in conditions in which the concentration of inhibitor is equal to the IC50, so the probability of the inhibited state is 50%. So we are here in this curve. And so we can obtain an expression for the IC50. And so this expression tells that the IC50 is proportional to the affinity of the antagonist for the active state, for the resting state. And also uh, the actual concentration depends also on the actual concentration of the ligand and its uh, affinity constant. So what do we learn from this equation? So first of all, we have quantified the IC50. So we learned that IC50 of a competitive inhibitor is proportional to its binding affinity. So Ki. And also that there's a relationship between Ki and IC50 in such a way that actually we can measure a Ki through a dose response curve, similar to what I've shown before for the neurotoxin, if we know actually the binding constant of a reference ligand and we have the concentration of the reference ligand. So that's the way Ki's are determined experimentally. So why this equation is actually useful? Because you can measure Ki not doing very um, time-consuming and uh, resources-consuming uh, experiments like ITC, but simply from a dose-response curve. So if you uh, promote activation with the given concentration of the natural uh, agonist for which you know the affinity, so basically you know this uh, uh, concentration ratio L divided by KD, and you measure the AC50 through those response, you can actually measure the KI. And so this uh, equation, which is called the chan of equation, is actually derived from this equation here. So using this scheme, you can actually rederive the chan of equation, which is quite reassuring. And then uh, the third point that I want to uh, raise, because that, that's uh, what we have done before. So we analyzed um, the case uh, with and without a conformational change. So in, in the presence of a conformational change of the protein, so in the, in the presence of an allosteric transition, this chang proof of equation is actually not valid anymore. And you have to complement this with uh, this correction. And so if E1, that is the getting, so the isomerization constant, the presence of ligand is actually large, uh, the chang proof of equation is uh, uh, actually um, overestimating the KI. And so you need to consider this correction if you want to use the equation to identify the KI. Now, uh, I hope I convince you that using this uh, uh, theoretical chemistry approach, one can find expressions of the efficacy of the potency the IC50, so the potency of a competitive uh, antagonist. But all these expressions so far, uh, particularly in the presence of uh, um, conformational transitions, they do depend on the liganded isomerization constant. And the, the, the disadvantage of these expressions is that, first of all, the liganded isomer isomerization constant is not known a priori. And one can say, okay, I can measure it for my protein. But actually, since this is liganded, it depends on the ligand. So what we would like to have is expressions, providing expressions where these pharmacological attributes are dependent not on E1, but on E0. That is the intrinsic ability of the protein to undergo activation in the absence of ligands. Now, if you wanna achieve this, we have to actually complicate a little bit the chemical scheme. And we can go to what we call a MW interpretation. So Mono, Wiemann and Change interpretation of the allosteric transitions, which essentially state that the resting and active state of the protein are in pre-existing equilibrium, even in the absence of ligands. 
So how can I actually translate this into chemical reactions? So what this statement that is the, the essence of the MWC model um, is that basically the resting state can populate the active state even if the ligand is not present. And so if I want to achieve activation, I actually have two pathways. So either I bind the ligand in the inactive state, I stabilize the complex, and then I undergo a transition to the active state. So that's pathway one. Or I can have pathway two. That is first, I undergo my isomerization spontaneously, so in the absence of ligand. And then from this, I bind the ligand to stabilize the active state with ligand bound. Now, it's not a, a dramatic uh, complication relative to the, the previous scheme that was not considering basically this uh, uh, step uh, of the spontaneous transition to the active state. But the great advantage of this reformulation is that we can put this equation in a thermodynamic cycle. And so if you put them in a thermodynamic cycle, you know that since delta G, which is actually dictating the value of the uh, equilibrium constant is a state function, so the sum of all the delta Gs in a cycle must be zero. So you have an additional constraint that you can actually use. And so in a cycle like this, actually what you know is that the product of the two equilibrium constant over the first leg and the second leg in this scheme should be equal to the product of the two equilibrium constant in the first vertical leg and the second horizontal leg. So in other words, using this thermodynamic cycle, we can actually express the liganded isomerization constant in terms of the unliganded isomerization constant, which is actually a property of your protein, plus a modulation factor that is associated to a ligand. So this is quite advantageous for two reasons. First, because we can be happy once we have measured E0 for our protein in the absence of ligands. And that, that's true for all other ligands that we want to investigate. And second thing is that actually this modulator factor depends on the binding affinities of the ligand for the resting and the active state. So let me go through this last example to show you how useful it is. So essentially, if this is true, then this implies that this modulation factor that multiplies E0 will be larger than one if ligands would bind stronger to the active state. Why? Because actually, I mean, that's one over the affinity for the active state divided by one over the affinity for the resting state, okay? So if KD is smaller than, KD for the active state is smaller than KD for the resting state, so this ratio here is actually larger than one. So you have a positive cooperativity factor, which implies that in the presence of ligands, it will be easier to undergo activation than in the absence of ligands. Vice versa, if your ligand binds stronger to the resting state, so in the opposite scenario, you have a suppression of the probability of activation, even below, actually, the basal conditions. And so in this case, your ligand would behave as an inverse agonist. Third scenario, if the ligand has no preference for active or resting, so these affinities will be the same. So this modulation factor is one. And so there's no difference in the binding, in the isomerization constant, so in the activation constant upon binding, uh, ligand binding. So what is quite interesting of this equation is that it's telling you that one can predict what is the effect of the ligand binding. So if, if it facilitates or makes, makes it more difficult to activate the protein, just by looking at affinities of the ligands for the multiple state of the receptor. So that's really the link within this uh, interpretation, theoretical interpretation. That is the link between activity and affinity. Because if I can evaluate through affinity the isomerization constant in the presence of ligands, then I can actually uh, evaluate efficacies and potencies. And then that's what I. I will show you in the in the next uh, five to 10 minutes before concluding. So one example that I want to give you um, that is a literature example where this uh, theoretical concept was used is actually a recent paper from Lina Luo and co-workers in which uh, uh, 
basically these authors studied mechanosensitive channels uh, and they wanted to classify two different ligands which are chemically related. Uh, those ligands are called Yoda-1 and Doku-1. Uh, so you see that you have basically a very, so the same chemical uh, uh, scaffold plus uh, a different derivatives on the left hand side. And what we know is that Yoda-1 is a potent uh, agonist, while Doku-1, with this modification, antagonizes the effect of Yoda and is not able to activate the mechanosensitive channel piezo one So essentially, Yoda-1 is an agonist of piezo one and Doku-1 is an antagonist. Now, in order to demonstrate or classify Yoda-1 and Doku-1 and to predict actually the direction of modulation, so agonist versus antagonist, these authors, they actually use the same scheme that I've just described, and they defined agonist efficacy as a delta-delta G of binding. And this delta-delta G of binding, if we go back, is essentially this ratio between the two constant here. And so what they defined by using uh, Krauyam structure um, of the piezo one in the closed state and a model of the open state. So they actually run uh, absolute binding free energy calculations for Yoda and Doku, both in the closed and the open state. And what they found is that Yoda one is about 4k cal per mole more affine for the open state, while Doku one is actually about 2k cal per mole more affine for the closed state. And so consistent with what we have said before, so molecules that bind stronger to the active state like Yoda would be an agonist or are predicted, are predicted to be agonist or molecule that binds stronger to the rest of the state would be predicted as an inverse agonist, which is exactly what Yoda 1 and Doku 1 are. So that's the first application I've seen in, in the literature of this idea. Uh, which was actually qualitatively, qualitatively successful. So if you are able to evaluate binding free energies uh, in the active and inactive form of your protein, you should be able to classify agonist and antagonist. Now, let me go a bit further. And I'm just watching the time and I, I've seen that it's already uh, one hour and 20 minutes that we discuss about this thing. So I will try to, to wrap it up uh, in the next, let's say, five to 10 minutes maximum. So if I want to go further, actually, I can go back to my original scheme, which is given by, of activation, which is given by the MWC model, and are then the assumption that basically at low concentration of agonists, the open channel probability is very small, as you've seen from this dose response curve. So essentially, although the scheme includes an extra step that uh, allows spontaneous activation, most of the time my channel will go first through the complex in the presence of the ligand and then activation uh, with the ligand bound. And so if this is the case, then it means that effectively in my chemical scheme, I can neglect the second pathway. And so I go back to uh, the chemical scheme that I have discussed before. So uh, activation through a conformational change. For which, I mean, we solved already the problem. And so we had expressions uh, for both the chemical constraints and expressions for both the efficacy and the uh, potency. And so, as you've seen before, so efficacy and potency, they're both quantities that depend on E1. So they depend on the uh, isomerization constant in the presence of ligands. And this time, using the results from the MWC interpretation, we can actually express the C1 as a function of E0 and this delta delta G of binding. And so the first result of this analysis is that basically I can find a quantitative expression, not just a classification method, to predict the agonist efficacy. And so it's not a difficult expression. And you see that it depends on actually two parameters. So one is the getting constant in the absence of ligand E0 and this difference in affinity of the ligand in the active versus the resting state of the receptor. So how can I use this equation? So first, uh, I need to evaluate the isomerization constant in the absence of ligand. And for most of the proteins, 
or for most, for some proteins, pharmacosteric proteins, through uh, analysis, which are called uh, efficiency analysis, the intrinsic delta G of activation has been already determined by electrophysiology and mutagenesis. Um, and so, and um, so electrophysiology with different ligands, sorry, with different antagonists. And so uh, people have collected data and then by extrapolating this data in this uh, linear relationship, they could find actually the activation energy. And so we observe, for instance, that for some receptors like the GABA receptor, this activation energy is relatively small. So it's about two kK per mole. And in some other receptors like the, um, there's not the nicotinic acetylcholine, but so the, the glycine receptor, for instance, we have five kK per mole. So different receptors, they have significantly different activation free energy. So it's easier to activate the GABA receptor than the glycine receptor. However, if I have this delta G0, I can evaluate actually the um, unliganded isomerization constant. And then what I can do is actually I can plot the agonist efficacy, so the maximum open probability, as a function of the delta delta G of binding. And so if I do so, I observe that there's a, a sigmoidal behavior. And then if this delta delta G is very large, so I have a significant selectivity of ligand binding to the active state, then the efficacy will be close to one. So I have full agonist. On the other hand, if this delta delta G, so the difference in affinity between active and resin is small, so it's about minus two or minus three, I actually have no efficacy. So this would be a neutral antagonist, okay? So dependently on how good I'm binding to the active state versus the resin state, I have all the possible scenarios. And so using, for instance, the delta G uh, of uh, activation of 8.4 kcal per mole, that is typically for the nicotinic receptor, and so this uh, uh, isomerization constant, which is pretty small in the absence of ligand, I can actually draw my curve. And then knowing the agonist efficacy of acetylcholine versus tetramethylammonium, that is 96% versus 78%, I can actually evaluate what is, I predict the delta delta G of acetylcholine and tetramethylammonium. And what is quite striking over here is that basically a difference of 0.5 kcal per mole between these two molecules can transform a full agonist into a partial agonist. So predicting partial agonist is very challenging because small changes in the delta delta G may lead to significant different uh, efficacies, ligand efficacies. The other thing that is interesting to, uh, to observe is that basically, uh, if I introduce gain of function or loss of function mutations, which will modify actually this uh, uh, act activation free energy in the wild type and therefore E0, I can actually shift this uh, curve. So I can shift it on the right hand side if it is a gain of function mutation or on the left hand side if it is a, a loss of function mutation. And now what is interesting to see is that basically uh, the delta delta G of binding between acetylcholine and tetramethylammonium in the case of a gain of function mutation would actually transform both molecules into full agonists. So a mutation that would be far away from the binding side can transform a partial agonist in the wild type into a full agonist. So that's what this equation is predicting. So the take home messages up to this point, so partial agonism emerges from a lack of selectivity for the active state. So molecules that bind equally well to resin and active are actually antagonist. And if I want to have full agonism, I need to have a strong selectivity for the active state. Then efficacies can be predicted from conformation dependent binding affinity determinations, because if I know E0, from efficiency analysis, I need to determine delta delta G if I want to predict quantitatively the efficacy. And then ag agonist efficacies depend also on the intrinsic ability of the protein to visit the active state. And so that's why uh, mutagenesis uh, uh, or mutation effects can modify the efficacies of ligands. And the four gain of function, loss of function, the modulate actually uh, the efficacies that we can measure. And so that's uh, 
a scheme that allows you to evaluate efficacies quantitatively. And now, what is interesting to observe is that this scheme, not exactly the same equation, but this scheme was recently used by Jens Carlsen, and that's what he presented in Strasbourg, I, I hope you remember it, to actually uh, classify and design de novo partial agonists. In fact, uh, in a uh, relative binding free energy uh, approach, uh, Jens Carlsen uh, applied essentially the same scheme uh, to evaluate the delta delta G of binding between two different ligands. So that would be a delta 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 G of binding. And that's what Gregory is talking about when uh, we have the, the workshops, the allowed workshop. And so uh, on the on the case of the uh, beta 2R two, two receptor, so that's a, a GPCR, uh, Carlsen and co-workers. So first they, they show that they could actually achieve accurate predictions of experimental affinities for the active and inactive states using uh, relative binding free energy calculations with a uh, inner square of 0 0.72 and the mean and side error of 1.5 kcalbromols, which is very, very good. And so that obviously is um, the first step towards uh, making predictions, uh, quantitative prediction. Second, using the scheme that I've just described, they were able to classify 31 previously identified compounds and agonists and partial agonist and non-agonist with an impressive accuracy. So I really recommend you to go through this uh, Angevante Chimie that is out since a couple of months. And then using the same scheme, they were able to actually design de novo new partial agonists with nanomolar potencies and a new completely, new completely scaffolds. So this is a demonstration to me that is uh, a theoretical framework is actually useful and that one is able to evaluate conformation dependent binding affinities, then we can actually design de novo uh, activities. So we can design agonist and partial agonist, or we can design uh, even modulators. Now, similar consideration can be done for the potency. So we can actually uh, rewrite the equation for the potency. And what we actually observe is that the potency is now really proportional to um, the affinity. And then we can actually uh, comment on this. So the potency proportional to the affinity for the active state. Potency is proportional to the intrinsic property of the protein to undergo E0, so to undergo activation. So the more prone the protein is uh, able to go uh, activation, uh, the, e, the, the, the stronger will be the, the potency. And uh, binding affinities uh, can be recovered from a dose response curve. And last, also binding selectivities. Uh, once uh, we can evaluate EC50s uh, for a given ligand on a given receptor, by making ratios between EC50s, we can actually evaluate selectivity coefficients for the same ligand to receptor A or alpha to receptor beta. And, and so this analysis, so this uh, binding affinity determination can be useful for evaluating potencies and also selectivities. Now, the same scheme is also possible for uh, allosteric modulations and also to include this sensitization. Uh, I think we're going a bit too far uh, and the time is uh, well advanced. So I just wanna wanna take this last slide to uh, introduce some take home messages. So uh, through a model like the MWC interpretation of Gatian, one can obtain analytical expressions for the pharmacological attributes of uh, modulatory ligands, so like potencies, efficacies, and selectivities. And uh, this expression depends on the affinity of the ligands for the active state versus the inactive state, so a differential binding affinity. And in this scheme, we can understand partial agonism. We can understand how the EC50, so the potency changes. We can actually predict selectivities. And I didn't have time to, to show, but we can also predict silent agonisms. And we can open to, in principle, computational error pharmacology. So the last slide to sort of uh, uh, summarize uh, conceptually what is uh, uh, the goal of my lecture today is that when we go from non-allosteric protein to allosteric protein, we need to think of a change in paradigm. Because for non-allosteric protein, what we're interested in is optimizing the binding affinity for the receptor. 
That's what we, we do all the time. And that is consistent with the scheme that I showed before, that is activation without a conformational change. So for non allosteric protein, is okay to optimize the affinity. And please go for it if you want to maximize uh, potency, selectivity, uh, and such. However, when you go to allosteric proteins, which live in multiple states, what we actually need to do is considering the affinity for multiple states. And so this leads to the change in the paradigm. That is, we need to develop methodology like uh, Lina Luo did and uh, Jans Carlson did and what we are trying to do with Gregory uh, to materialize conformation-dependent pharmacological assays or state-dependent pharmacological assays. Generally, that's very difficult experimentally because you also always have an equilibrium between the active and the inactive form. And so what you measure is a mixture of the affinities. But in specific cases, using constitutive mutants or specific molecules like antibodies that actually promote activation or promote deactivation, uh, it, it is pos also possible experimentally to determine this delta G per conformation. And so once we have this determination, then we can start designing agonist, antagonist, partial, uh, posit partial agonist, positive and negative modulators. And so we can really open to computational neuropharmacology. So I thank you for your attention. I hope uh, the lecture was not too long and I'm happy to take questions, if any. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for this very insightful talk. It was really very interesting, I think. Uh, I think we have some time for a few questions. I uh, just, uh, I don't know if we wanna also record uh, the questions here or if we should stop the recording. I guess uh, I'm recording probably, or, yeah. So we'll do it better.